Hi everyone, I'm Francesco from the Android Developer Relations team. And together with Kenneth, we are going to have a look at the best practices to update your app for a larger screen, like a tablet or a Chromebook. We will consider the opportunities that a larger screen brings, the challenges you might encounter, and which Android APIs will help you to overcome them. Also, if you want to learn more about using Compose to support different screen sizes, have a look at the talk Implementing Android Apps for All Screen Sizes. The large screen experience on Android is becoming more delightful. 12L is a special feature drop that makes Android 12 even better on large screens. It brings an optimized and polished system UI and makes user experience like multitasking, more powerful and intuitive. You can experience this first and with many of the Google apps you know, rolling out updates to take advantage of large screens. We also released a new set of material guidelines to help you create delightful apps for different form factors. Make sure to follow the responsive layout design guidelines and check out the large screen compatibility guidelines. This list defines the criteria to help you assess the level of support your app provides for large screens. There are currently three different levels defined. From a minimum of handling configuration changes and multi-window mode, to supporting fully optimized interactions like drag and drop, multitasking, using a stylus and others. So review the guidelines to make sure your app is compliant and presents a best-in-class user experience for large screens. Updating your app for a new form factor always means challenging assumptions you may have made in the past about screen size, orientation changes, user interaction, and app lifecycle. For example, 12L brings an improved taskbar for app switching. That makes it easy to drag apps into split screen and multi-window modes. It's extremely important to test your app in these scenarios and make sure it behaves well on resizable windows. Using your app in multi-window also means other apps can try to access shared resources like the camera or the microphone at the same time. So it's essential to add the logic in your app for control and access. If the display size is bigger than 600 dp and you lock the orientation to portrait for your activity, this will enter into compatibility mode on Android 12 devices when users rotate the device in landscape. So remember to also test the behavior of your app in compact mode, as many assumptions you may have made regarding the app's aspect ratio or screen orientation could not be valid in this modality. Not only Chromebooks, but also many tablets are now being used with an attached keyboard, mouse, and stylus. A great app experience means supporting these input modes. We won't cover this topic in this talk, but check out the Input for All Screens session to learn more about input support beyond touch screens. Now you may be thinking, a lot of broken assumptions means a lot of code to be changed in my app. Well, don't worry. We've got you covered as we are continuously improving our libraries and APIs to support you in this task. The Android Jetpack collection contains a lot of useful libraries to help update your app for larger screens, like Window Manager, Sliding Pane Layout, and Drag and Drop, to name a few. We have new UI components optimized for different screen sizes and the resizable emulators to test your app. To start diving in all of them, I lend it over to Kenneth from the Android Framework team. Thanks, Francesco. Let's start off with Jetpack Window Manager. This is a library to support new device form factors 
and provide a common API surface for supporting different device types, including foldables and tablets. With the library's initial stable release earlier this year, let's talk about some of the APIs available to help make your app experience on larger screens better. We've brought the Window Metrics APIs that were introduced in Android 11 to Jetpack Window Manager to provide a clearer API surface for window size information, while allowing you to support older versions of Android with ease back to API level 14. These APIs also aim to reduce the confusion that existed around previous display APIs, such as display metrics. We have exposed APIs to get both current window metrics and max window metrics, which you can access using the window metrics calculator as seen here. Current window metrics will give the bounds of your current window, while maximum window metrics will provide the largest bounds your window could have in the current device configuration. As an example, this could change if the device is folded and unfolded, or if an external monitor is added to the device. Current window metrics is the main API that you want to use if you need to make runtime decisions around UI options or choosing specific assets that are relevant to your current window size. This value should be recomputed with any changes that may occur to your window, such as if you are being resized in a freeform environment or entering and exiting multi-window mode. These values can be accessed during the onCreate method in your activity to help provide information before you make any layout passes. Now, building upon the raw information that you can get from window metrics, we know that choosing the right breakpoints when thinking about supporting different device sizes can be tough. So we're now providing an easy and standard way to put devices into three size buckets, compact, medium, and expanded. Window size classes provide a device-independent way of thinking about how your UI adapts depending on available space. This will ensure it works well in all scenarios, including when running in freeform windows on desktop form factors. That said, compact is most representative of smartphones in portrait. Medium represents many foldable devices and tablets in portrait. And expanded represents tablets and Chrome OS devices in landscape. These provide opinionated layout breakpoints for you to know when to adapt your UI. They are also aligned and documented with the material design guidelines. We will be providing an API to retrieve these values at runtime in Jetpack Window Manager 1.1, but these definitions are also good breakpoints to consider if you are using resource qualifiers to bucket any UI changes. We suggest that you provide at least a design optimized for compact and expanded width sizes and choosing the most appropriate for the medium size. Now, we know that updating legacy code bases to support new architectures and screen sizes can be challenging. And while we still recommend moving to more of a single activity architecture, we also wanted to provide solutions for apps to be able to make UX improvements for larger screens without needing to do an entire overhaul. This is where activity embedding comes in. Activity Embedding is a set of APIs that enable apps to place multiple activities side by side to provide a multi-pane view. This is a common UI paradigm on large screens that has been difficult for multi-activity applications to implement previously. Activity Embedding aims to allow you to enable these UI paradigms with little to no code changes to your app's core logic. The Activity Embedding APIs will automatically choose the right presentation based on the available screen space and the settings that you provide. This means that you don't need to handle these checks and branch conditions in your code to handle different window sizes. The library also supports screen and window size changes at runtime, like folding or unfolding a device and entering multi-window mode. There's a lot more to the Activity Embedding APIs that we can't go over in this session, so please check out our Activity Embedding guide with the link you see here. Now, if you're using Fragments already, then we have included some of the same functionality into sliding pane layout to make it easier to build these adaptable layouts. Updated in version 1.2, sliding pane layout will provide a more seamless UI experience when you're in larger windows. Sliding pane layout uses the width of both panes to determine when it will automatically switch from a single pane to a dual pane layout, removing any manual size checks that you have to make. It also supports adapting to display features such as folds or hinges and will separate your content at logical splits in the display if there is enough space to do so. Your user's navigation experience can require some changes as your window size gets larger and adding the navigation rail component to your app can provide a great user experience when you're on devices wider than a phone. 
but maybe not as large as a full desktop environment. While we are used to the bottom navigation bar at the bottom of the screen on our phone, when the layout scales across screen sizes, we may need to switch components. In this example, we use a bottom navigation bar on compact devices, and we switch to a navigation rail on medium devices, and switch again to a navigation drawer on expanded devices. Removing the bottom navigation bar also allows your content to have more vertical space, which may help if the user is using a phone in landscape. Navigation rail was built upon the same interfaces as bottom navigation bar, so that switching between the two is as seamless as possible. Let's take a look at a sample app. Tracker has five main screens in the app, and they can be accessed either from the list screen or via the bottom navigation bar. Let's see how this changes when we switch to a bigger screen and use navigation rail instead. The switch to navigation rail doesn't change much in how a user can navigate through the app, but it does unlock the ability to create a new task directly from the navigation rail instead of previously only being available through the floating action button. This change did significantly reduce the number of tabs that were required to navigate through the app to certain destinations. With navigation rail, all destinations are available without needing to open a bottom app drawer. Think about where you may be able to expose functionality that may have been hidden behind a menu when you start to have more screen real estate to use. To learn more detail on how we brought Tracker to the big screen, check out the link here for a detailed blog post going over the efforts. Navigation is only one part of the UX considerations that occur when supporting larger screens. And for more detailed design and UX guidance, check out the Designing Apps for Large Screen session. Now, throwing it back to Francesco to go over more ways to make your app experience the best it can be on larger screens. Thanks for the great overview, Kenneth. Let's now explore another interesting use case for an optimized app experience. Drag and drop is becoming increasingly relevant for large screen form factors. The ability to drag data from one app to another is a natural experience for users as they multitask more efficiently with their apps in split screen. While Android has long supported the drag and drop, drag event was introduced in Android 3. Integrating full support for handling gestures, events, permissions, and callbacks has proven to be complex. Now the Jetpack Drop Helper Utility class just hit beta release. Combine it with the Drag Start Helper it's easier than ever for you to handle this kind of interaction in your app. Let's see how to use it. Drag Start Helper is a utility class from the Jetpack collection that detects gestures commonly used to start a drag, such as long pressing or click and dragging with a mouse. You can easily set and customize the visual look of the dragged object by modifying the drag shadow. In this example, we are just using the default one. Note also the global flag that allows for cross-app dragging. Since this is a content resource identifier and not just plain text, we need to use the drag flag global URI read to allow other apps to read from our content provider. Without it, other apps won't receive the drag events. The counterpart is the new Drop Helper, a utility class that takes care of listeners and drop targets. An important thing to remember is to use add inner edit text when building Drop Helper options. To ensure proper drop target highlighting, all edit text elements in the drop target view hierarchy must be included in a call to this method. Otherwise, during the drag and drop operation, the focus may be acquired by an edit text within the target view rather than the target view itself. You can read more in the drag and drop guide on Android developers and dive into the sample code on GitHub to see the library in practice. If your app uses a custom viewfinder, it's very likely that that code needs to be updated too. Camera apps generally assume a fixed relationship between the orientation of the device and the aspect ratio of the camera preview. But these assumptions are being challenged by new form factors, such as foldable devices. 
and display modes such as multi-window and multi-display. If you lock the orientation to portrait in your camera app and you are not handling configuration changes, your camera preview may look like this compatibility mode. To understand why this is happening and how to fix it, we need to analyze a few important concepts involved in correctly handling different orientations and window sizes. We refer to natural orientation for the orientation users tend to naturally use a device. For example, this is likely landscape for a laptop and portrait for a phone. For a tablet, this can be any of the two. Starting from this definition, we can define other two concepts. We call camera orientation the angle between the camera sensor and the natural orientation of the device. This is likely dependent on how the camera is physically mounted on the device and that it's supposed to be always aligned with the long side of the screen. But hey, what is the long side for a foldable device as it can physically transform its geometry? For this reason, starting from API 32, this field is not static anymore, but it can be dynamically retrieved from the camera characteristics object. The other concept is the device rotation, which measures how much the device is physically rotated from its natural orientation. Since we usually only want to handle four different orientations, we can consider only angles that are multiples of 90. And uh, we can get this information by multiplying the value returned from display to get rotation by 90. Here we can see a code snippet that computes the rotation required in degrees to transform the camera sensor output orientation to the device's current orientation. Note that the rotation needs to be clockwise or counterclockwise, depending if the camera is facing the front or the back of the screen. And then we basically just calculate the difference between the two concepts mentioned before. With some math to make sure the value is always between zero and 360. However, handling the orientation does not guarantee a correct camera preview. For example, in multi-window mode, you may need to display a landscape-shaped camera output into a portrait-shaped window. So you will need to either crop the image or scale it to match the aspect ratio. Otherwise, without the right transformation, you might end up with a shrinked or distorted preview. Correctly transforming the image in every possible scenario can be challenging. So we published a step-by-step -step guide based on the Camera 2 APIs to help you in this task. If you instead don't need to access the low-level camera APIs, the Jetpack Camera X can be the right solution for you, as it automatically transforms the preview for every screen size and handles the camera life cycle for example, by updating the viewfinder after configuration change and uh, controlling the camera access in a multi-window environment. Camera X releases are also continuously tested on many different devices to ensure compatibility. And speaking about testing, I'm going to hand it again to Kenneth to explore this important. Thanks again, Francesco. Creating great experiences for these larger screen devices is awesome, but let's talk about some resources available for you to iterate and verify the great work that you're doing. We have created a new resizable emulator coming soon to Android Studio that lets you quickly toggle between four reference device sizes, a phone, a foldable device, a tablet, and a desktop. Also, when using the foldable reference device, you can also toggle between folded and unfolded states. We've chosen these device sizes as we feel they cover a large majority of the devices that your users are on, while making it easier by not having to switch emulators to switch display sizes. This flexibility makes it easier to both validate your layout design time and test the behavior at runtime using the same reference devices. To create a new resizable emulator, use the device manager in Android Studio to create a new virtual device and select the resizable device definition. 
Also, in the latest Android Studio Canary, we are releasing an Android desktop emulator. This aims to provide a native desktop environment for testing on devices such as Chrome OS. This emulator features a few key changes and differences to help test in these scenarios, such as having freeform windows be the default, as well as having easy resizability, better hardware keyboard support, and a default lack of a soft keyboard in most scenarios, and better input support from a UX perspective, such as having mouse hover actions be visible on the emulator. And as always, testing on physical Chrome OS devices is a great and easy way to easily test how your app handles changes to window sizes and input modes. Now that we've talked through ways to update your existing app to be a great experience on larger screens, let's look at five key takeaways of what you should do to update your app for these devices. First, make your app resizable and make sure that you're testing different scenarios such as folding, unfolding, as well as multi-window mode. Handle and test different orientations and transitioning between them. Optimize the way that your application interacts with other apps and multi-window environments by adding drag and drop support. Make sure you're checking your camera layouts on tablets and when in multi-window mode, as well as devices with different default orientations. And finally, look at supporting different input modes, such as keyboard and mouse, to provide a better user experience with these peripherals. Thank you for watching our session, and we look forward to seeing what you build. Mm -hmm.